uh, I've seen him grow from strength to strength uh, in life, uh, in, in his career, in his relationships, um, most importantly, his relationship with God. And it's truly been one of my greatest privileges of my Christian life to uh, walk alongside you, Dan. The way I've seen him working out his faith as he goes through life is something that I aspire to and that I encourage every single one of our young adults to as well. So can you join me as I pray for Dan before he preaches today? Father God, we just want to commit Dan into your hands today. We pray that you just be with him as he speaks your word. Anoint his words today as you've anointed and continue to anoint his life. We commit his message into your hands today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Mike. Wow. Good morning, everybody. That was a very, very nice welcome. It's funny that Mike shared that photo because it's in my slides. I love that photo. It's like one of my favorite photos. Um, look, good morning. As you guys know, today I'm speaking on our generation, um, generation 1830. And I'm just testing. Is this, is this working? Not too sure of it. Thank you. Um, look, for those of you who have seen me before but don't know me, you may have seen me up here and you're wondering like, why I'm not holding a guitar if I'm about to bust out in a song. That's not happening today, sorry. Um, today, I get the privilege of representing our amazing generation, the 1830 ministry here at FGA. So a little bit about me, just as Hubert helps me out. Um, I've actually been at FGA for, this is my 17th year. So I've been here a long, 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 long time. Um, I actually grew up in our fungus youth ministry and I started there when I was in year seven, and that's where I met people like uh, Hubert. I met people like, like in the picture, there was Gene Bell, um, Pastor Chris, Pastor Quentin, those kind of guys. And I just can't believe that I'm here now, and I'm like, okay, I'm at the edge of 1830 now, by the way. So I'm like 20, 29 soon. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, it's just amazing to ha have kind of gone through all of the different, I guess, ministries. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really a privilege to actually be here, up here speaking. And I do want to take time to really honor um, Pastor Chris, all of the pastoral staff, for entrusting me with this. It's, it's an amazing privilege to me. And all of the leaders, all of the staff, the elders of this church who have seen me grow up here, who have spoken words of wisdom, sowed into my life, it's actually, um, it's actually changed who I am. So I really want to thank and honor um, all of the people here at FJ for doing that. Okay, amazing. So a little bit more about me because I think it's going to help give context to what I share today. So I am married. I'm married to the amazing Carissa Yo. This is a picture of us getting married. I was, oh, in 2021, I got married by Pastor Chris in front of all of our friends and family as well. Um, this is another picture of us at Pastor Chris's favorite place in the world. Um, yes, I know my hair's a little bit messy. I've been told I need to comb it. So this is a picture of me growing up in fungus. So that's me on the left in year 12. That's me on the right in year, oh, sorry, me on the left in year seven, me on the right in year 12. That's actually Hubert behind me. I'm in the middle. And that's Pastor Chris behind us shouting at all the youth to get a move on, to go, come on, come on, you know, get into the game. You can see he's kind of got the same energy. Um, and uh, since then, I have started in ministry. I've served in a few different places at FGA. Um, after I graduated from year 12, I became a fungus leader. So that's me and some of our leaders on the left there. And... The one on the right is um, our worship ministry. So I've been serving in our worship ministry for quite a few years as well. But more recently, I have begun leading in our 1830 ministry. And I've had the privilege of focusing on discipling younger couples with Carissa through our foundations group. So we disciple a number of young couples um, and I also get to journey alongside some of our leaders as well. So that's a picture of some of us. The left is us at our retreat. The right is us playing some pickleball together. 
So yes, I am not a pastor, so I don't have a master's in divinity or anything like that. But today I am sharing with you as actually a product of the, char- of the church's pastoral efforts, actually. And I'm hopefully speaking, you, speaking to you as somebody who re- just represents um, a common FGA person. Someone that I think embodies the culture of our church being the son of the house. And I want to actually share that all of the speakers that have been speaking in our generation's weeks, they've actually personally impacted my life. Uh, Sonia, who spoke first, she, sp- she taught me CRE when I was in primary school, I think, with Auntie Melinda. Um, Pastor YC, who I call my unofficial godfather. He calls me son every time I see him. Um, Jordan, um, my bro, who, is, who was my youth pastor alongside Ruth. And then Shah next week, who's a close friend of me and Carissa. But I'm saying this today so that hopefully you can kind of follow alongside me as I explore this right topic of our generation. And it's the notion of choosing the right thing. You may have noticed that we did a few fun things today. Like we asked you to choose your outfit. Hopefully it was representing your 1830 self. Um, We asked you to choose an outfit for our game host. We asked the members of the game to choose the answers that an 1830 person would represent. And I'm exploring this idea today because I really believe that right now, us young adults, and maybe even others, we're actually in a culture and a generation where we feel the pressure, and I feel the pressure even now, that our purpose in life is to make our mark. And how do we know we're making the right decisions? I tell you, in my young adult life so far, I've had so many changes in the seasons of my life. I've had so many big decisions come up, and I know that there will be more decisions to come, but just to run through a few, completed a university degree and started my career, choosing maybe what I want to do for the rest of my life, got into a relationship, got engaged, married, moved out into a new home, traveled to different parts of the world with friends, and explored much more deeply my faith, and my values in life. And look, these are all milestones and decisions that have influenced the course and and the trajectory of my life. And they've all been purposeful, but they've been equally stressful. And I think my generation can agree with me when I say that we've been working so hard under the pressure of needing to know whether we're making the right decisions in life, whether we're choosing the right partner, Man, we have that conversation a lot. Whether we're choosing the right job or maybe whether we're making the right friends. And it's not easy. I get it. I mean, today after church, we're going to be battling a really big problem. Where do we eat? (laughs) I I tell you, our group of friends, our generation, will spend about an hour debating and deciding where we're going to eat. And that poll and that, um, that question is actually so apt for our generation. Are we going to go to MK? Are we going to go to Grand Tofu? What do we feel like eating today? Is there enough space? How many people are coming today? There are so many factors and we're talking to, we're just debating with one another and we're just trying to figure out what's the best decision. <laughs> just this last month, I have spoken to so many people about I guess something that we'd call the quarter life crisis. It kind of describes this period of insecurity in our life, right? Where we're going, oh, what what do we do with our lives? There's so so many doubts. Uh, I don't really know what I'm going to do. I'm feeling a a little bit like confused. um, This is a definition by a um, clinical psychologist, Alex Falk. He says, that the quarter life crisis is a period of insecurity, doubt, and disappointment surrounding your career, relationships, and financial situation. And I would stretch that even further to say for us, our spiritual satisfaction and walk. There are LinkedIn surveys that show that 75% of adults aged in their low to mid 20s, all the way up to their early 30s, are experiencing some form of a quarter life crisis. Trying to understand what it is in their life that makes sense, that is the genuine thing that they wanna pursue. And to feel confident 
and content that they're making the right decision. And yes, while this may be a phenomenon of our I generation, our Generation Z, I don't think that it's limited to just us. I believe that young families go through this. Young uh, teenagers go, to, go through this to some extent as well. And that's a picture that I want to paint today, that we're living in a results-based society highlighted by peer-to-peer -peer comparison and comp competition. It's exacerbated by workaholism and hustle culture leading to spiritual dissatisfaction and disillusionment in our purpose, of which I must admit, I am not immune. There's an internal dialogue going on in our minds. And we're saying these words to ourselves. Every step I'm taking, every move I make feels lost with no direction. My faith, it's shaking. But I've got to keep trying. I've got to keep my head held high. Now, some of you might hear those words and think, yeah, that's me. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Others of you might hear those words and think, wait, isn't that The Climb by Miley Cyrus from the Hannah Montana movie? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> but I think it's kind of, it's kind of, it kind of paints a pretty clear picture of where our generation is heading. And I know maybe some of our young adults, our younger guys haven't seen this movie. Give it a go. But I grew up watching Hannah Montana. And yeah, yeah, I know they love Taylor Swift. Um, there's some other songs, but I, I tell you, there's a, there's a splatter of songs that are relevant to our generation. But I just thought I'd kind of hone in on this song because it's funny. This movie is actually about a girl who is torn between her life as a normal, everyday, rural kind of um, American girl versus her life as like a mega pop star, essentially. There are some other songs like um, the song that was playing in our promo video that was made by Jin, who did an awesome job. Can we give it up for Jin? That was uh, Live While We're Young by One Direction that talks about like making the best of your life and just like living in the moment and not really caring about the decisions you make almost. Or maybe like it's a K-pop or K-drama song. Man, every second person is obsessed with a K-pop or K-drama song. My wife committed to learning an entire K-drama song in Korean <laughs> just so that she could like, you know, feel what the actors felt in that movie. <laughs> I'm like, well, Maybe we should spend more time, I don't know, remembering a psalm or something. <laughs> nah, I'm joking, I didn't say that. I sing the, I sing the song with her as well. Um, but, you know, these songs highlight something in our lives, whether it's The Climb by Miley Cyrus, exploring how decisions we're making are difficult and we're trying to find an answer to them. Or it's songs like Live While We're Young by One Direction that talks about wanting to make the most of your life. All this to say that as a generation, we're called digital natives and society's creatives. We're capable, yet seem unavailable. We're spoiled for choice, yet yearn for a voice. We desire to be seen, but not simply as parts of a machine. We need to be right about our purpose in life. We're just trying to find the answer to, I guess, our meaning. So really, what is it like to choose the right thing? As young adults, I don't know if you've asked yourself this question, but I've, I, I think I have in some way or another for the last 10 or so years of my life. And I tell you, the answer lies not in these fun and exciting songs that we can sing to, but actually in the Word of God and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And so today I want to share with you this psalm, Psalm 16. That's what I'll be kind of speaking on. It says in Psalm 16, I'm going to read it here. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. They drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their name on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lions have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I, will not, I shall not be shaken. 
Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to show or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that it will bring truth and light into our human condition and into the things that we um, think about even on a daily basis. Lord, we pray that as we look through your word, as we discover and explore this topic, Lord, that you would, um, your Holy Spirit would reveal things to us in new ways. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Okay, so this psalm's written by David, and for those of you who don't know who David is, he is an amazing character in the Bible. So just a bit of a history lesson. David, he was a shepherd boy. He was called to kingship in his early like teenage years through, um, through the prophet Samuel. He went on to become an aide to King Saul and a warrior in the army. Eventually, he became a king at 30, right? But before that, he was actually persecuted by King Saul, who saw him as like a bit of a threat, right? He was persecuted by King Paul for several years during his 20s. That's a quarter-life crisis, in a sense. He definitely had a worse crisis than some of us. Um, He was persecuted by Paul, and I mean persecuted like he wanted him dead, right? So it wasn't like, oh, what should I do on a Sunday? Where should I eat lunch? It was like, man, there are enemies on my left and on my right. And he wrote this psalm from a place, actually, of realization and knowledge that God and the presence of being, uh, and the notion of being in the presence of God was all that he needed. My, my message today is really simple. It's centered really on only two points. One, that God is our contentment, and two, that God is our confidence. So to, to start, God is our contentment. It says in Psalm 5 and 6, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lions have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I want to just focus in on chosen portion um, for this point. You know, David's not speaking actually about a physical, physical portion or a physical inheritance, but he's talking actually about God himself as his inheritance. And I'll share a little bit more about that in a moment. But the words portion, lot, lines, inheritance here, they they speak in the Bible about like a measured allotment. So uh, like a physical distribution of like land or something like that, right? Now who knows that in life, we're constantly trying to make sure that our allotment kind of satisfies our desires, that it's good for us. We were talking, we've been talking about MK a lot, and I think this is kind of like the flagship restaurant of our generation. But I don't know if you found this recently, but serving sizes have been getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> and so when you're going out to eat, you order your favorite dry wonton mee, and it comes to you and you're like, what the, there's like, 10% net less noodles than there were last week. And I want to share a story because we were eating at uh, MK the other week with some friends and we, two of us ordered these dry wonton noodles. One of them was noticeably larger than the other one. And one of us kind of said, oh my gosh, I don't remember it being that small, but your portion looks like a lot bigger. And with no shame at all, one individual said, could we swap our, <laughs> could we swap our, our, our portions? the allotment given to us. Of course, since we're such loving people in 1830, they switched. (laughs) Um, But look, look, that's just a a classic FGA food analogy. But really what I'm I'm trying to talk about is that in life, the allotment that is given to us sometimes isn't as exactly where we wish for it to lie. And David, I think, understands this. But as he was sharing in Psalm 16, he's saying that the Lord himself is his chosen portion. Not the circumstances he's been put in. Not the fact that Saul was was persecuting him for several years. Not the fact that he was king of Israel or that he had so much land and so many soldiers under him. But that God himself 
was his allotment. The allotment actually alludes to the distribution of land in, in Canaan in that time when it was divided into the 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. And in Numbers 18.20, it was written that the Lord said to Aaron, you will have no inheritance in their land, nor will you have any share among them. I am your share and your inheritance among the Israelites. God was saying this to the Levites, the only tribe in Israel that didn't get any physical land just for themselves. He was saying that to them instead that you won't get physical land. You won't get that big portion of dry wantonomy that you want. Instead, me, just me, God, I am going to be your, your inheritance. I am going to be your allotment and I am going to be your portion. So this is what David's echoing. Despite him being king, he's chosen that God would be his allotment. In today's attention economy, there's a pressure of not just doing everything, but doing everything right. Yeah? And we're trying to make sure the lines are falling so well for us that we've got plenty of room in our big house, that we've got a nice car to drive in, that we've got plenty of friends around us, that we've got a job that's respectable, that we've got parents that praise us. And don't get me wrong, they're, they're all good. They're all well and good. But there's a pressure of not just doing everything, but doing everything right. And this idea of success, I think, has kind of evaded some of us young adults, and maybe not just young adults, but people of God. Wayne Mueller says in his book, Sabbath, a successful life has become a violent enterprise. We make war on our own bodies, pushing them beyond their limits. He goes on to talk about the different things that we're trying to fit into our life, trying to decide and walk, of, walk down. And we're making um, decisions in our life, trying our best to make sure our allotment and the division of our property is satisfactory to our own measures. But I want to reiterate that that's not the case. God is our contentment. He's the one that draws the lines for us. And he's the one that says that these lines, they've fallen well for you. That the allotment you have, the trust that you have in God, his presence himself, as it says in the entire psalm, is what will bring you pleasures forevermore. And it is what will carry you through this life. Now, my second point is this. It's all well and good that God's our contentment. But it's kind of hard sometimes, I think trust in God. We know he's a faithful God and he's written about himself in these ways in the Bible. But sometimes the circumstances just don't line up. So this is my second point, that God is our confidence. In Psalm 16, 8 to 10, it says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. And get this, you make it known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Our circumstances and even our successes in life, they might seem like they're on track and they might seem like they're giving us great purpose. But I guess I just want to pause to challenge everyone to do a reflection even now. Do they really bring you, us, fullness of joy? And do we have complete confidence and faith that they are what will carry us through this life and into eternity? My encouragement to you is to read this psalm and to remember that it's actually God who makes known to us the path of life. He is our confidence. And when David was writing this, I think he was writing this not just because he was confident in God, but almost as a way to build and foster that confidence, to remind himself that God was at his right hand and he will not be shaken. That God himself makes clear his path and, dis and the distribution of his allotment and that his presence will actually give him pleasures forevermore. 
David is secure and confident in God. And he chooses to profess that the very essence of being in God's presence is contentment and confidence itself to navigate life. So do we have confidence in the path set before us by God? Because without it, I admit, it, life can get pretty stressed, stressful and we can get lost. Last, you know, last year, we, um, as a family, my, myself, Carissa, and my parents, we visited America. That's how we had that picture from Disney. And we went to the amazing Yosemite. So ha has anyone been to Yosemite National Park? Anyone? I see a couple of hands. Beautiful, beautiful place. Beautiful. But whilst in the day when you're kind of on the cliffs and you're walking through the beautiful lakes and stuff like that, it's like so serene and so like amazing. When, you, when you're walking the paths at night with no reception, no light, uh, nobody around, things get pretty hairy pretty quickly. So this is a picture of us. Oh, so Chris is taking this picture. I don't know if you can kind of see it because it's a bit dark, but that's kind of me in, in front of her. <laughs> and we're hiking at about, I don't know, what is it? Six? maybe like 7 something p.m. We're hiking to a place called Sentinel Dome. So it's one of the main uh, landmarks in the, in the Yosemite National Park. We, we started this hike without my parents because they were too tired from our morning hike. So they chose to sit in the car. So we thought, you know what? We've got a couple of hours. We could make it there and back. So we started this hike and it was beautiful at the start. The sun was shining. It was a glorious, glorious hike. But out of nowhere, the sun just began to set. And we had no kind of idea where the track was going or where it was ending because we were the only people on this track. By the way, in the morning, there were hundreds of people around on the many hikes that we were doing. But for some reason, this hike, and I think Carissa did some research. She said, oh, it's a very um, peaceful and like romantic hike, you know? So maybe there won't be any people around. It can kind of be just us or just with my parents and we can take our time walking it. I think that was actually probably a bad idea because there was absolutely nobody around. And we were hiking through this path. We realized that the sun was setting really low. We had no reception. We had no light. And very soon we were walking with um, our phones as lights and we had some like headlights, right? But you know, the, our batteries were running quite low. And I was, I was sweating and sweating because we were like, we've got to run, we've got to hurry up because we've got to get back. Our parents at this point were probably worried, sick. They can't call us, there's no reception. And they're wondering, where are these guys? We got to the point where there was a fork in the road and we were either to go this way or that way, right? And I, I, I wasn't confident at all. But Carissa, she said, no, no, it's this way. We've got to turn right here. This is the way back to the, to the car park. So we started going down that road. And before long, I realized this, this is endless. And we're going off course on our GPS. There's nobody around. And this doesn't even look like a proper path anymore. Yeah, I was getting kind of stressed. And when, I think anybody that's married here knows that when that kind of happens, you kind of, also, there's a bit of tension rising as well. And that's, not a, that's, that's another bad ingredient, right? So we were kind of at it against each other. And before long, we were basically on a, on a, on a, a not untrodden path, right? So I looked at my GPS and I'm like, okay, there's a road there. Let's just go, let's just find the road. That's the, le that's the least that we can do. So we were hiking around, we were walking, we didn't know where we were. And we finally got to the road and the road was just a main highway, right? Just a highway. So there's no path back to the, back to the, um, back to the car park. So we started walking up, the, up this road. It's a hilly road. It's about a 30, 40 minute walk apparently to the car park. I was like, oh my gosh, do we even know what we're doing? Do we even know if that's the right place? At this point, I was just second guessing everything. I was really... I was kind of scared, to be honest. And that's when we had this amazing idea to, to, to the, do the good old, you know, thumb up. <laughs> so we were walking along the, the path and we were just doing this, you know, for the whole time. <laughs> and before long, a car pulls up next to us and they go, you guys okay? And we're like, oh yeah, we're just kind of lost and we need to find our way back to 
the car park. So they said, all right, why don't you come in? Just, we'll, we'll bring you up there. It was so nice of them. We sat in the back seat with um, a, a couple in the front and the grandmother sitting in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a bit of a strange experience. Um, but lovely, lovely people. And they took us back to the car park. Um, and they told us, oh yeah, this has happened before. It happens all the time when, we're, when people are hiking, you know, late at night. And we've got to look out for each other. Um, it's happened to us before, it happened to us in another country, this is them saying. So we just want to, you know, help you guys out because we know it's, it can be a bit scary. And so by the end of that, they brought us to the, back to the car park. We told them our parents, it was a, it was a whole ordeal. Um, but I just think of that story because, you know, with God in the picture, it doesn't have to be that stressful. It doesn't have to be that confusing. Um, and God actually provides us the blueprint and he maps out this path of life. And sometimes it does get a bit windy and sometimes you take a wrong turn and you end up tussling with people around you. But he's always there with a lifeline. And he's always there to show you that in him, you'll have gladness and security. He won't abandon you. He will cause you to rejoice and he will bless you with pleasures and, jo and the joys of his presence. Like David, we ought to build and foster this confidence in God. And I understand that circumstances may not allow us to do that so readily sometimes. But take this psalm as an encouragement from David that even in those times, let's reposition our faith and our stance to say, God, you are my portion. You are my contentment and you are my confidence. And even when I don't feel that, I will proclaim this and teach myself to know that your promises are true and that I want to build and foster this confidence in God. It reminds me of um, like playing sport, like swinging um, for a spike in volleyball or even um, like your golf swing for all of the older uncles that play golf here, like my dad, who I play golf with. Um, you know, if you don't swing through with confidence, if you don't have speed in your swing, it invites disaster in your form and disaster in the, res in the result, right? Uh, yesterday we were playing at a golf sim. I was playing with um, uh, Josh and James and I kept thinning my ball. I kept like hitting it like really poorly. And Josh said uh, something to me. He's like, maybe it's because you keep slowing down. Maybe because you're not swinging through confidently and maintaining your speed. Um, and I just kind of thought about that in a sense that that's kind of like our confidence in God. You know, when we, when we stop and when we hesitate and we think, I don't know about this map that God's laid out for me. I'd rather maybe walk my own path. I'd rather maybe find Sentinel, Sentinel Dome by myself. I think it invites confusion and it invites this sense of disillusionment and misunderstanding that we can figure it out ourselves and we can get to the end point where we'll be all happy and we'll be all content. David's challenging us, one, to be content in God, and two, to be confident in him. Recently, as a 1830 leadership, we've been going through the Emotionally Healthy Leadership book by Peter Scazzaro. And it's been challenging us to take Sabbath, a 24-hour period of rest and contemplation in God, as a spiritual discipline in, our, in your life. And personally for me, this has been pretty life transformational. To see Sabbath not just as a physical rest, but as a way of displaying trust and confidence in God and enjoying his presence and pleasures as a means of worship and intimacy with him. By, putting that, by placing that 24 hour time aside in your week, it's saying that I don't need to figure it all out. I don't need to hustle and achieve everything that I think I need to. But I can give this time to God to say, you know what, even in this 24 hour of seemingly non-productive behavior, God is still working and God is still in control and God is still the Lord of my life. Don't get me wrong, it's a really hard thing to do and I'm, I'm still struggling with it. Uh, Peter Scazzaro actually says in, in his book when he's speaking to a clinical psychologist about the idea of putting this Sabbath in. He says, 
you're inviting people into practices that might as well obliterate their sense of self. That the idea of placing your contentment, your confidence and trust in God is an obliteration of your sense of self. Now, if that isn't contentious or challenging, then I don't know what is. But I'll encourage you, like it says in Hebrews 10, don't throw away your confidence. Continue to build it, right? It says it will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you'll receive what he has promised. So I want to sum up my two points. That God is our contentment and that God is our confidence. You know, the path of life that God sets out before us, the path of righteousness is like the morning sun shining ever brighter to the full of day. Sorry, the full light of day. This is from Proverbs 4, 18. This is probably my favorite proverb. And this, in that one sentence, there's just so much wisdom. That unlike or contrary to the setting sun, when you're walking and getting lost in Yosemite, the path of righteousness, it's actually like the morning sun. It shines ever brighter and it continues to illuminate your path and continues to show you the ways of God till the full light of day, till the fullness of righteousness that God has placed before you. So today, I encourage you not just to choose the right thing, but to choose righteousness. We can look to Jesus actually as the model and the prophetic um, answer to Psalm 16. Jesus knew how to perfectly set the Lord always before him. And he trusted in God through to the cross that God would carry him and God would actually, through the power and authority of God himself, would raise him from the dead that he would be the perfect sacrifice for us sinners, that we might be in relationship and to have full access to God again. Righteousness is walking in the ways of God and we can do so with contentment and confidence if we look to Christ as the template, our example and the, and the provider of these things. I mentioned before that our, me and Chris have been doing some, um, this kind of discipleship course or group with a few different couples. This is a picture of some of us. We actually have another group this year. We don't have a picture with them because we're terrible at taking photos. But um, they're all awesome. And the, the verse that we actually, the passage that we talk about a lot is this one. This has been, I guess, the anchor for the last year or so of my life. It's Colossians 3, 12 to 17, which actually starts with saying, Put on then as God's chosen ones. God chose us to put on all of these qualities of Christ and to let the peace of Christ rule and to let the word of Christ dwell in us so that in everything we might walk in righteousness and follow his ways. Church, I want to encourage you today that it's not so much that everything you know, you're doing all of the goals you have in life are wrong. That's actually not what I'm here to say at all. It's more that, I guess, as a reminder from me that despite all of those good things, they don't carry the same weight and assurance that God does. For me, I think growing up in this church and exploring my faith, I found that God has always been my constant. And He's a reminder that in Him, I can be confident and content. You know, just personally, as a young adult, I was just reflecting on my last, I guess, 10 to 12 years. And there have been some times that I've really questioned my purpose in life and questioned if I'm kind of doing the right things. I remember failing at uni in my final year and feeling like I was left behind as my peers graduated. Feeling like I wasn't ahead enough in life and feeling like maybe I made the wrong decision to study what I studied. More recently in my life with changing friendships and changing seasons, um, thinking about my financial situation. Carissa and I recently had a fairly significant financial hardship 
that has created a lot of stress in our family and wondering, you know, am I in the right job? Am I making enough money? Is it enough to provide for my future? And so I read this Psalm as a reminder to myself as well to say, yes, these things are happening on the, on the outside, but let's not forget who's actually walking right alongside of us. Jesus and God as our right hand, giving us pleasures and confidence and joys forevermore. For those of you that know me, you know that I, I, I'm a fan of music and um, I like like jazz and listening to these sorts of things. Um, there's a quote by Bill Evans. I don't think young adults would know who this is, but maybe some of the older people might know Bill Evans. Um, he's a, he was a jazz artist. He says this quote, there are no wrong notes, only wrong resolutions. I think life's a little bit like jazz music sometimes. There's like kind of a few different ways you can go about it. And it's a bit of a free form sometimes. And you might get a bit confused about what you're playing because it sounds a bit funky. But the whole idea of jazz and improvisation is that it's not really about specifically what you're playing, but it's actually about how you resolve what you're playing. And so today, if you think that the resolution is that um, all of your desires are wrong or all of your achievements are not important. That's not the resolution that I'm hoping we come to. But rather, it's that Christ Himself and the provision of God is our true contentment. He's our true confidence and the one who will carry us through this life. The anchor verse for 1830 is this. 12, uh, Romans 12 verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And that's my challenge to everyone today, that as we go through life and... Um, like I said, it's not limited just to just us young adults, but I think everybody here, that we continue to trust in God and we continue to look to Him as our template, as our confidence and contentment. And so to end, I actually wanna just give the opportunity for people to respond actually. I was thinking on how to, to round this off, but I think that there, there are some of us that need to, um, that need to reaffirm their confidence and their contentment in God and to realign their faith with the standard of His living word and not to the standard of our world. And not that you'd be swayed by any fancy words that I'm saying, but that you'd be tugged by the tender whisper of the Holy Spirit. So as we kind of come to an end, can I just invite everyone to just stand with me? And I'm just gonna pray for each and every one of us. And as I pray, or before I pray, I, I wanna invite anybody here that feels like they not just need a touch from God, but feels like they need a reminder or feels like they need to make a stance again, that they wanna walk in the ways of God, that they wanna choose God as their, as their confidence and their contentment. So if that's you today, can I just encourage you to even raise your hand right now or, or, or raise your hand in surrender, whatever it is, just as a sign to God to say, Lord, you are my confidence. You are my contentment. And I wanna trust in you that the portion of who you are, your very presence is enough for me and that you, Lord, have drawn the lines well for me. So if that's you, can I just encourage you to raise your hand as I pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, for your, Father, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you, um, you love each and every one of us. Um, you know the, the, the troubles and the challenges we go through as young adults, and not just as young adults, but as a wider congregation, where we feel the pressure of achieving, we feel the pressure and the struggle of making the right decisions in life. But Lord, we thank you that your word comforts us and your word tells us that you are our contentment and you are our confidence. You walk beside us, you will not abandon us. You make the lines pleasant and in your presence, there's fullness of joy and fullness of pleasures forevermore. So we thank you, Lord, and we receive this promise and we receive this blessing. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen.